to Revolutions to come back on stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we may not be able to stay seated here. We'll see. We'll try this. But uh, so we're, we're getting uh, close to the end here. Um, our hope for this next, uh, you know, the final session here is to do a couple of things. One is that we're going to reprise very briefly a couple of the themes that we talked about yesterday morning. We're going to share uh, a couple of examples about how to apply the design thinking process to the prototyping that, you know, Sajan, thank you, that was a fantastic presentation and, and sets up the rest of this uh, beautifully. Uh, and then really just jump in together with you um, and, and we'll be looking for some volunteers to share with, uh, with us uh, what you're thinking from yesterday to today and we'll workshop, workshop some of those ideas together in real time. So uh, for starters, you know, uh, this, this quote is a good one to, to, to re-anchor us to, the, to where we left off yesterday. I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past, Thomas Jefferson. It's just leaning into the uncertainty. So in terms of, uh, you know, this should all look familiar, right? We are in this transition moment. Uh, as an industry, in the state, uh, as a field, uh, frankly, the entire industry is in the midst of transitioning from one curve to the next. And each individual and organization lives wherever they live. Uh, and each time you meet someone in that conversation around innovation, to Sajan's point, is meet them where they are, right? And try and move to the next point on the curve. Uh, we talked about the six mega trends that are helping fuel this, this transition. And we talked about the role of design and design thinking. Um, so we're going we're gonna to share a couple of examples, um, but first I want, to, I want to echo a couple of things that Sajan just said in, in his remarks, which are just, uh, you know, we couldn't have said it better ourselves, which is start, right? You don't need to have uh, the, the clearest, you know, final vision of what this will ultimately look like. Um, you, you, you just need to have, uh, I think a good starter kit is, the, the seed of an idea and a, a little bit of a pit in your stomach, right? If there's something about the idea that makes you at least a little bit uncomfortable, you're probably on the right track. Just to be pushing enough and start. And then the second thing that, that Sajan said that we very strongly believe, and it's really at the heart of design thinking, is be as clear as possible up front about what you're trying to do, right? The if-then statements that we talked about yesterday. And it doesn't have to be uh, we're going to transform the entire school by next year. Um, but you get started by getting started. Um, and the notion of here's what, we, here's what we're trying to do, either to solve a problem or this opportunity that we want to pursue. We think if we do X, Y will happen. And, and we think that that's good because, you know, <laughs> list your Z reasons. And then you try it. And then you pull up. After a cycle, and, and we'll talk a, a bit further about that in just a second, about how long it takes to test different kinds of ideas. But you try it, and uh, you see what you learned, you see what impacts you get, and, and you go from there, right? You scale, you shift, or you scrap and move on to your next best idea, or a new idea that wasn't there the first time you went through the process. So we're going to give a couple of, of uh, specific examples, and then we will uh, dive into your ideas. We had the opportunity to begin the conference on two high chairs, and now we're awkwardly <laughs> seated next to each other. So I'm going to iterate and stand up and come forward. Now, we may do a couple of other configurations when I go to the back. The point is there's no A in your model. There's no 105. There's only the next version of your idea. And you mm -hmm. improve daily when you iterate. Everything that Sajin said, and we've you know tracked his progress and been a fan, and looked in on their models, but it started with this simple premise, didn't it? The way we started the conference. He had a challenge, a problem he was asked to solve. And what kind of statement did he make? He looked at that solution and hypothesis and he started. I mean, what amazing progress on each of the prototypes that he shared. And then as he looked at that and said, okay, here were some outcomes, he's also looking at what's next. 
there were things that Sajjan learned and shared in version one that I'm sure if you grabbed him after the conference and said, what would you not repeat? He'd have a whole list. So part of getting better is taking the risk of failing forward and really knowing what that means. When you get it back to your schools, because you stayed till the very end of this conference, you're passionate, we know that, right? You're saying, I wanna learn more. But don't let today be your final iteration. It is just the beginning. So if we look at this example, this simple one pager, it was similar to the way we started on page 17 to open the conference. When you look at the resources from today's talk, you will find six other themes and examples of small prototypes. Here's one on policy, which Sam and Sajjan were talking about on stage of how do you think differently about policy. If your state will not do it, did you know that there are school boards in North Carolina that have already proposed getting away with seat time, uh, ab abolishing the Carnegie unit, that that's on the board dockets now? They're not waiting for the state board. They're saying, what can we get a waiver on? How can we iterate and test? So I challenge you to have those conversations as well, because those types of seeds and innovations start with a simple problem and a simple if-then statement. Now, the word on change. This is not easy, okay? And every week when we talk with schools and districts and organizations across the country, we try to stay on this top line. We try to make sure that the vision, the skills, the incentives, right? We don't have 1,000 calorie uh, keg pops, but in many cases we have extra time, compensation, extra rewards or recognition. But as you go across that top line, the hope is you stay there. The reality of leadership and managing change is that often those boxes kind of, you know, gray out or black out. And the art of leadership is figuring out on that second line, okay, my folks are confused, so maybe my vision needs a rewrite. Maybe it's clear to me what my vision is, but our staff does not understand it. So have I spent some time visualizing that vision and making it meaningful? When you look at skills, maybe what I've asked people to do is creating anxiety because I haven't spent the time to adequately build their capacity to do it. I love this notion in Sajjan's talk about the white hat of coaching being totally separate from the black hat of evaluation. Mm -hmm. And when we tend to go on the white hat of coaching, we show up as a friend, a supporter. So we've got to build that area of skills so that the rest of the change management chain can line up. So I'd encourage you to look at this slide, to keep it by your desk. And as you hear people pushing back on, you know what, you're asking people to do this sea change in our schools and on line three, you have not provided, right, the skills to make it happen, training, on line four, we're not being incentivized. You want us to all volunteer our time. So as you think about the change management that is inherent in this, this is a key slide to really think about what's possible as you move that forward. We talk a lot about this diagram as a short cycle methodology, 30 days, 90 days, 120 days. You are going to run into barriers. You're going to run into objections. And as you think about managing that change, make sure one of those spots is not grayed out. And if it is, think about how to make that possible. Sajjan talked about the three things you wanna do, right, as an educator. A lot of times, it's asking a simple question back to your team, back to your department. What three things could we do in the next 90 days to help you be successful? That's how rapid iteration happens. As we pivot to where we began, I'll segue back to Todd and assume sort of an armchair stance while he finishes this, okay, yeah, and, as another iteration. And if he's going to stand, I guess I can't sit. Um, so what we want to do here is just get, get some of your ideas, right? So this is where we left off yesterday morning was this, this challenge of, you know, even if it's early scribbles, right, it's, it's an idea around the problem or challenge you're wanting to, to, to overcome, an opportunity to pursue. Uh, where are you with if-then statements and what did you need to learn or what did you think you needed to learn more about over the course of these couple of days when you left yesterday morning session 
so we're going to be looking for uh, some volunteers here just to share. Uh, what did you What did you scribble yesterday morning? What did you learn in uh, over these couple of days? And and in particular, now what? Like now, how how was this experience of these couple of days influence your thinking? So I'm squinting into the lights here, but. Um, can we, can we see some hands of folks that are, are willing to share? Uh, and this is all just in the spirit of obviously, you know, very drafty thinking, but I uh, would love to invite someone to. Come on. This is going to be a lot less interesting <laughs> if there are no ideas to talk about. Here's Excellent. one back here. Excellent. She gets an extra cake pop. <laughs> okay. So um, in my early college, Wilkes Early College, we have graduation projects. And I really believe in the spirit of the project, but I have a really hard time getting students to get out of their comfort zone and find mentors that aren't their grandma or their aunt or the woman down the street or the dad down the streets, my friend's dad. So after the business industry tables, I want to try to bring in some business people or community members to talk to kids, maybe put them in small groups like we did here. Sorry, this is very, very drafty, like you said. The That's other good. idea that I had was to try to do the STEM groups and have them problem solve with each other. I want to do cosmetology. Who do I go to? How do I contact that? I want to help animals in my community. What do I do? And let the kids help each other instead of them all coming to me because my brain is tapped. So there's some things I'm hoping to apply. Good, and, and if you don't mind, what, what if anything did you think yesterday morning, if you had those ideas at the end of yesterday morning session, what was it you were hoping or imagining that you might have a chance to learn more about or be exposed to over these couple of days to help push that thinking? And it's okay if, if, if it's unclear. It was kind of unclear. Um, the things I jotted down was like scheduling, um, big school ideas, feeling constrained in my day and helping teachers mm -hmm. learn and grow. Um, helping students be successful, that was one of my quick jots. So if I can do this with a graduation project, then that would sort of answer that, be, helping them be successful and feel like I've done something great. Fantastic. So what, what we'll spend just a few minutes here, and Brian and I will sort of take turns, um, is to think that that is, you know, we'll, we'll stick at least for the moment with the first one, this notion of, you know, uh, how to help students um, uh, initiate, develop relationships with, with mentors and others that will get them outside of a sort of closed-in network. So that's a nugget of a great idea. So the question is, uh, how, do you, how do you operationalize that, right? What would it mean to take that idea uh, to the next step, period, let alone to sort of take it to the, to the full, kind of embrace this notion of prototype design and, and all this? So first things first, and, and, and well, let me start by saying, um, in this is this slide and the next one. There, there is a document that we've uploaded in uh, to the conference resources. Um, that's just a simple two-page document. That it's it's kind of a worksheet that you can use to take uh, to to use this process. Right? It walks. You can see the first page walks you through. It's a little a little small for me, but you know it's defining, um, naming some of those barriers. Um, it encourages you to brainstorm the solutions and hypotheses. Um, if there are many, you go through a process of prioritizing, like here are five ways that, that we could do this, which one do we think makes the most sense and why? And then on the second page, and this is what we'll come back to in just a second, but this is where you, you sort of turn a corner and say, I had this nugget of an idea. I went through a divergent thinking process, and we're going to come back and do this, uh, uh, hopefully one or a couple of times. And then we arrived at this specific idea. Now, what do I do to make this specific idea something that we can actually try. And you see that these are just very simple prompts in here, but they, it's, it follows the logic that you've been hearing several of us talk about over uh, from between yesterday morning and Sajan's talk and, and some of the things we just said, right? What, what is the core innovation, right? If you boil off all the complexity, what is it that you're trying to do? Um, who was involved, right? When does this happen? Um, the notion of uh, what resources do you need? It might just be staff time. You might need dollars. You might need uh, manipulatives or other kinds of instructional resources to do what you're talking about. And it's, you know, and, and finally and most important, and this also links to this, the the points that Brian and I and Sajan made about what do you what do you hope to achieve and what do you expect to learn, right? It 
it's the process of, of just being as explicit as possible about your own thinking that makes it a really valuable uh, prototype. So without being clear with that, these are still very good ideas, and you should still try them. It's just that if you, if you skip the step of trying to be clear up front about what you're doing, why you're doing it, what you think will happen, what you hope to learn, and how you'll know whether or not it worked, then they're just good ideas that you tried. And once you're changed by the 90 or 120 days of experimenting with that idea, if you don't have the benchmark, the thing to look back to that you put down on paper, it's harder. Right? It's harder to look back. You can still do it and say, what did we think then? But better to be clear right up front and, and challenge yourself. So going back to uh, the example that you just uh, shared. And I'm sorry, what is your name? Uh, Lita? Lita, OK, thank you, by the way, for volunteering. So the idea is uh, too many kids are knee-jerk response is to go to someone they already know, right? And, and you're postulating that we think it will be a better, richer experience for kids if they get outside of that comfort zone and access uh, a, a mentor or adult with dot, dot, dot. So help, help give us another uh, layer or two of detail. That Behind that, you're saying, I think that if they uh, get exposed to uh, adult mentors outside of their known network, what, what, is it that, what is it that these people will know, or why will, the, why will the experience be different and better for kids? What, why, what's, the, what's the thinking? My thinking is, and I think the spirit of the project is, if they get out of that comfort zone and connect with those people in the community, they can see what it's like maybe to work that job every day. Mm -hmm. um, they would also have a very objective view when you're working with your aunt or your grandma. They're not going to, I don't want to say criticize, but they're not necessarily going to give you the real picture because that's my grandchild or this is my niece or nephew. So having that real example of what to do and how to do that feedback, authentic feedback. Um, Perfect. Uh, I mean, if you have more to say, keep going. But, but that, that's, that's, that's fantastic, <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's being explicit that it's not just uh, get them outside of, of the grandma network. It's that if they get to a professional outside of their known community, they're going to have an experience that will be more authentic. It will be the, the potential is greater for it to have an impact on them and how they see you know, their understanding of the broader world or uh, you, you know, their potential role in it, right? So fantastic. I mean, you can, that's just a small example of how you can just continue the, the, the sentence. Um, another uh, tool or heuristic that we use a lot when we do this kind of work is the five whys, right? Is to just keep asking why. So why will it be better? Well, you know, why should they have a different mentor? Well, because they'll get outside their, you know, their network. Well, why will that be better? Well, because they'll, they'll, you'll be exposed to, to someone with more experience and that's, you know, uh, more objective. Okay, why, why would that be a better experience for kids? And it's a very simple thing that just forces you to kind of dig to the root cause. Um, okay, so it, keep moving forward and we say, let's, uh, for the sake of, uh, uh, efficiency. We don't. We won't go through the kind of whole brainstorming. But you can imagine. All right. What are, you know, how, what are what are the ways in which we could do that, right? So it's, well, who do we know that you know? What are the existing partnerships that we have that we could access some of these relationships? They're going to be. There's conversation around how do we? We've got this idea. Here's why we think it's better for kids. How are we going to go about doing it? And then there's a process of. Uh, prioritizing the, the ideas that you come up with. And you might decide that you came up with five ideas and you actually want to pursue two of them. That's also great, right? But once you get to this side of uh, this, this process, it's like you're, you're kind of turning a corner and saying, all right, what are the basic ideas that uh, we need to put in place so that we can, we can try this? Right? And for the sake of argument, let's say that there were two strategies out of the five that you brainstormed that, that you like, right? One is uh, to, to reach out and attempt a brand new relationship with the Chamber of Commerce or some kind of local network where you think that you, you might have 
mentors that uh, might be interested in this. Completely new outreach. And the other strategy is let's, let's like huddle our faculty together and brainstorm. We need a list of 25 folks that are not in the, in the grandma network. And we're going to be strategic about who they are and how we're going to connect kids to them. This one, this one becomes a little bit of a, a more abstract example just because it's not, it's not developing a sort of in-classroom or in-school kind of example. But just to sort of carry this uh, a half step further, it would, uh, you trying to jump in here? Uh, let me pause, please. I think the five whys always leads to the five hows. Yep. So when you do community outreach from a practitioner standpoint, we often lead an education with, wouldn't you like to proctor? Right? It's not exactly the sexiest invite to the business community. <laughs> or we'd lead with, wouldn't you like to donate to a playground? So we move to the how too quickly. We were, we're already into solution mode. But just as it's important for you to form relationships with kids, it's also important for you to form relationships with the business community. So by bringing them together with a how step, once you ask those five why questions, you may find that some of the mentors want to come for a monthly breakfast. You may find that they want to gather in a place where the kids are gathering. So it's not long before you'll get to structures, and then you need to be regular about the structures, right? So this always gets to your time and what you can manage as a teacher and what you can test in terms of your schedules and your own bandwidth. So what I would encourage you to do in that first 30 days of your prototype Look at parent engagement models that support graduation projects, and then steal the pieces you like that will work for your context in Wilkes, right? And then with your team, invite business folks in or mentors in to say, what do you think about these? What would you improve? Because you want to involve them in the iteration cycle too. And before long, you'll arrive at some house steps that are tangible and that you can test. And going back, if Todd will sort of flex back to our design graphic. Uh, one more back. Yep, one more. Two. There we go. You'll know very quickly on the stop sign whether you should pause because this is too much human capital and you know what? It's not working. We've got very low turnout. Maybe we just scrap it. But at least you'll know that after 30, 60, 90 days and you won't try to extend resources throughout a year. Or you might say, wow, we got 20 people. We got to figure out how to manage this. Let's shift it a little bit and test it some more. Or this is working. We set out to get 10 partners. We have 40, and they're all mentoring kids. Let's scale that to other grade levels. But to the key point of this presentation, start. And it's OK after 30 days to say, OK, we need to, need to scrap it. It's too much resources, doesn't work. Then start your next solution for kids that you want to test an idea. Just the, the, the last uh, piece I want to stick with on that one example, just to kind of close the loop on, on this one, is if we jump to the far right column, um, the, the, the how will you know if it worked, right? So this is in the category of, you know, we started with here's our problem, here's our potential solution, and why we think it will be better for kids. Um, fill in all the middle part about how we're going to pursue this idea and operationalize it, and then you do it. And then whether it's 30, 60, 90 days, whatever's the appropriate time frame for the kind of idea to pull up, um, you want to be able to look back at whatever you sort of capture at, at that far right column. So let's, uh, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but let's think together, right? Given this example, how, how, how would we know if it worked? We think that if kids are exposed to mentors outside of their known network, they're going to have more authentic experiences, they're going to get more objective feedback, which we think is just better, right? And you might sort of go on to specify that further. But at the end of the experience, how will we know? Thoughts? Student work. Okay, well, improved student work. Okay. Good. Students uh, demonstrating increased ability to dialogue about the work that might not have been the same case. Please? But, uh, parental increased parental involvement. Say, say more about that. Why, why is that evidence of? Just, just like, is there student if there's student growth in the classroom and they see that there are things that are working, I think parents would feel a lot more encouraged 
to mm -hmm. really start to partake in their child's education. Okay, our school is actually taking a step forward. Our students are doing something. We're seeing growth. I want to be a part of this. What can I do to ensure that my child continues to grow? I want to work with you. So I think that that shift should start to happen. That's interesting. I like this example because uh, I think that I think that's uh, right on, and that would that would fit uh, as a, as a sort of clear answer or or a recorded idea in in the how will we know if it worked, more or less depending on if you included you know evidence of parental involvement and satisfaction uh, as part of your upfront objective, right? And there's there are no there are no like rules about whether you know. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 this isn't about an accountability exercise, but it's really about the sort of if-then logic. So any other ideas about how, how we would know that this worked? More students will want to engagement. Perfect. More students will want to be involved, and back here, uh, increased community engagement. So yeah, is there another thought here? Good. risk that where they explored their own passionate projects that were not academically related but related to their lives um, it was just a, a place of happiness the parents are happy the kids are happy they don't want to leave they are mm -hmm. becoming such a well-rounded child and we call it voice choice just really taking a risk to explore um, their interests, their passions in an authentic, relative way. Wonderful, thank you. So yeah, evidence of student initiative on top of everything else to sort of pursue more of these ideas. So imagine that these are among the ideas that are recorded um, up front. And then you get to the end of the three month process. We'll just say it's a 90 day uh, process. And then you get back together, you and your colleagues that have been involved in this process. And you look and you say, well, this is what we thought. This is what we thought would happen. This is what we did, how we thought it would work, and what we hoped would come out the other end. What actually happened, right? And you're going to learn whatever you learn. And some of the things will be, our hypothesis was spot on. And we saw like engagement, and you know the, the student reports were much stronger in all these ways. Um, interestingly, we said these other two things, but they, we didn't see any evidence of that. So why, right? That's, that's sort of the magic of this approach, is that you will not get it right, uh, certainly not on the first try, right? Uh, 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 well, I don't want to rule out the possibility that you might, but very often that's not the case. Um, and it creates the, the structure for constantly asking the question, what are we doing? What do we want the outcome to be? And you know, if, that didn't, if we didn't reach that outcome, why? Right? It's, there's no judgment in it. It's, it's, it's an inquiry-based methodology in the sense that you, you want to understand why and say, oh, it's not that, you know, what we actually thought is that it wasn't the wrong idea. It was that we didn't implement it right, or there was a mixed fidelity, or what, you know, whatever it is that's going on. Or sometimes, so that, to, to Brian's example, you might say, whoa, that, boy, we didn't see that coming. That totally backfired, and we think it was just not a great idea. It was not a good strategy. So let's go back and think you know, you back up again. Yeah, I think when I hear the example, give me your first name again, um, talking about the voice school. Um, I'm Carla Gravitt from Mecklenburg County Public Schools in Virginia. Okay. Awesome. So when I think about your example, why is, it the case, why is it the case that that's not true now? And there's lots of things that those schools did from a culture standpoint that were really remarkable. So who are the schools now, whether it's New Tech Network, KIPP, yes, aspire, that are doing really interesting things around culture building. And, and what's happening at those schools that you can prototype and test? I'm not talking about taking their full academic model or their discipline model. I'm saying, what is it that they're doing that's really compelling around culture? And could that work here? And let's test the logic. One of the things we're finding with student-directed ownership and student-directed learning is that if you really want to change your school culture, start having students on advisory councils. Start asking them questions mm -hmm. about what success looks like to them. So in my classroom, in a very small prototype way, what if every week I posted a problem for the week? 
that I was trying to solve as an adult. And I wanted their sticky notes. I wanted their ideas. And then slowly I began to introduce, here's a novel idea, prototype thinking for kids, where part of the way they solve problems or show evidence of learning is to test and fail, test and fail, test and succeed. So let's really think about how we empower them to create the cultures we want. Um, <clears throat> that made me think of uh, uh, an example, a quick story that I wanted to share. One of the, uh, one of the, the, the most compelling uh, schools that I've been in uh, is part of, some of you may know the New Tech Network. Um, they, they use project-based learning. It's a, it's a really interesting network of, of schools. This was uh, Columbus Signature Academy in uh, rural southeast Indiana. And there were, um, the, the way, the, the, way the, the space was laid out, they, you know, the, the, the faculty would collaboratively plan each next thematic unit. Um, they had a, you know, a hallway that the kids are you know, moving back and forth on. Off to one side is sort of a little bullpen of the teacher's desks and areas. And just opposite that was a little cubby with a whiteboard. And this is where they would uh, plan. Right, the, the faculty would plan, but as a result, there was a big whiteboard, and they were working on the next thematic unit, and uh, there are all these like sticky notes up on the on the, the whiteboard for what they were preparing for the the next units. And while we were there, there are kids passing between class, and all of a sudden, this this one young woman stops, and she's sitting there, and she's looking, and she's reading, and she starts picks up the sticky notes and rearranges some of them, and then she you know gets out the notepad and and writes a couple of her own and sticks them up on there. And we were really struck by this just sort of, and it was all so seamless, and then she went on to class. But it's this notion of involving, uh, you know, that, that's a, a fun example because it's both, you know, students and faculty, to Brian's example. So, um, you know, in, unless one of you has uh, a specific topic that you're interested to use a few minutes to workshop together, we can also just open this up and see if there are, you know, general questions you know, for those of you who are thinking about whether and how some of the ideas that, that we've talked about that Sajan has used to great effect with Matchbook of leveraging this sort of design thinking approach to innovation and how that might work in your schools. So are there um, thoughts, questions, comments? Is everyone tired? <laughs> yeah. Got one over here. Here's one, great. Um, ben Owens from Cherokee County, um, and I guess I really don't have a question. I would just like to um, reiterate, I guess, semi-veteran of, of these conferences. The, if I think about the culture and the fabric of my school, a lot of it came just from a spark of an idea at this type of event or summer mm -hmm. conference or the previous STEM conference. Or, and so I'm, I just jotted down PBL, student-centered, the rounds, critical friends, the STEM, the competency-based, the emphasis on the skills, and I could go on and on. And all of those, no, I, I can't think of hardly any of them that really were top-down driven. They were all from ideas that came here, obviously facilitated by the folks at new schools, the instructional coaches, leadership coaches. Um, but it works. Yeah, there are failures, and none of this is perfect, but the, our school, the character of our school, the amazing things that we're able to do with students are from doing exactly what you said, taking an idea back, um, and, and Jason and I are going to be driving back for seven hours to, <laughs> to get home. Uh, we'll, we'll expect a full report. Exactly. On the that. Yeah. But, but we will percolate these ideas and go in, and we know that we've got that, that atmosphere of support to make it happen. So I guess I would just reiterate that what you guys are saying. It, it is so very true in this network, and we're so fortunate to be able to take these ideas and make them happen. It is. Uh so easy to recognize a learner in chief when they speak, no? Mm -hmm. uh, kudos to you for having empathy over ego, right? Spending time these past few years trying to empathize with what people are doing and understand it and then having the maturity to come and test and fail. We have a culture in our business of did I get it right or what am I going to be evaluated on? Mm -hmm. And 
when Sajin talks about the fear and the inner voice of the entrepreneur, I think a lot of times there's an inner voice from our staffs on what might happen, and they tell their own stories versus being given permission by those they work with to fail, iterate, et cetera. So as you work with your staffs and you take these ideas to test and shift and, and scale, celebrate your successes and have fun with your failures. Make it a part of the culture to have a day where people display what worked and what didn't. Mm -hmm. And figure out how to move that needle to where it's okay for students to also have those hypotheses, for them to test them and to talk freely about why things didn't work. Some of our best lessons come from failure, and hearing you speak you know, reaffirms our belief that the folks that are still here trying to dig down for those nuggets, right, from this conference, their value add to their staffs and teams because they want to learn. But we've got to create that space for kids to learn and that it's okay to succeed and fail. Good, any other thoughts, questions? Looks like not so much. So what, what we want to do is, uh, well, two things. One is uh, just say again, th thank you, not only for, you know, we very much appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and share some ideas with you, but more importantly, thank you for the work that you are doing. Um, it is uh, not always appreciated by broader society as, as much as it should be, and this is the hard work, this is the creating of new opportunities for our young people that, that need something more and different than, than the way things have been done. So we thank you very much for, for those efforts. Um, the, this is the question that we want to leave you with. Um, what are you willing and able to commit to trying? Right, And uh, that's the one that we want to, to, to linger with you as you leave today. Um, and the answer can, can, can constantly be changing, right, because it's get started. Um, and as a final, um, you know, Brian, you may have some, some closing thoughts, but um, we, we also want to make sure that we've got the, the link here for, uh, we said that we would make sure to encourage everyone to, to jump online and complete this uh, brief survey for the entire event, just so that the, the team here can get uh, good feedback on which aspects of it worked more and less well uh, for future planning. But let me, uh, for my part, say thank you and uh, leave it to you, Brian. You know, I think it's a dream until you capture it. Once you mm -hmm. capture it, it becomes a goal and a destination. Mm -hmm. So you've got an opportunity on this feedback form to share your reflections, but you also picked up a lot of tips, a lot of tools at this conference over the last two days. When you get back, really work on establishing a place at your school, both physically and online, where you can capture your progress and you can indicate what's happening and people can visually see it. Part of the reason we ask for feedback is because we want to learn how to support you, whether it be the conference organizers or whether it be us working with you. Uh, I'm sure at Matchbook, you can see how they track data, they tracked where things were happening all the time. Involving others in how you're doing and what those metrics are, too many times in our business are test scores and formative test scores and summative test scores. Have other metrics that you're tracking, satisfaction levels, events that you've garnered participation at. Talk about them on your loudspeakers. Talk about them on your connect ed messages to families. Leave here with the goal of a communications mindset that you're going to test, you're going to experiment, and I think you'll be fine. Thanks for your time. Thank you to Todd and Brian. Um, that does bring us to the close of the conference.